Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Chen, uh, Curatorial Director for Design Miami, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us uh, for this talk today uh, called Common Ground. Uh, it's a discussion that will help us close this year's rather special edition of Design Miami in a rather special year. Uh, the theme that we took uh, this year has been Americas with the S in parentheses, uh, and it's been an effort to help us rethink design uh, that's in, of, uh, or about, and about America, while also asking how we might expand the narratives uh, of design and what America itself might mean through design or through, through the lens of design. Uh, the aim of the, of the uh, um, America's exhibition, which we've mounted at the Moore Building uh, in the Miami De Design District, is to present a more inclusive portrait of America that celebrates the fact that there are many Americas, um, but at the same time, we are, of course, doing this at a moment uh, when we are also seeing uh, that there are also Americas that are perhaps more divided and polarized than ever. And so in this context, we've been really honored to present in the show uh, with the support of the Friedman Benda Gallery, the in-progress debut of Adam Silverman's Common Ground, uh, which is an almost epic project, as I think you'll see, uh, through which Adam is proposing what these days sounds like the most radical idea of all, uh, which is reconciliation. Uh, we have Adam here today to talk about that project, and we also are very honored to have uh, with, with us uh, Scott Alves Barton, who is a, a foodways professor and activist, uh, which we'll want to, to uh, talk about more with him, uh, who teaches food, environmental and cultural studies, writing, anthropology, uh, with a focus on race, ethnicity, and global cultures at uh, NYU uh, in New York, the New School, Pace University, and Queens College. Uh, he's also been involved in many projects and initiatives uh, along these lines. And we also have Bobby Tigerman, who is the Marilyn B. and Calvin B. Gross Curator of Decorative Arts and Design at LACMA, where she has been for over 14 years, focusing on modern and contemporary design and craft. So uh, on that note, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Adam, who is um, really a, um, an, an incredible um, well, artist, designer, potter. I don't think the distinctions or definitions really matter anymore, but he works uh, primarily in clay uh, in, 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 in uh, very uh, rigorous and, 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 and uh, experimental, conceptually um, fascinating ways. And he is going to give us uh, a, an overview of this really uh, incredible project, Common Ground. So uh, Adam, please. Thanks, Eric. Thanks um, for having me and for hosting the project, the sort of um, snapshot of the project as it stands a year into it. And thanks, Scott and Bobby, for being part of this with me. Um, so the project began, um, the project, which is called Common Ground, began September 2019, so a year and a bit ago, with a conversation that I had in New York with a collector an art collector um, and, and specifically as well as a very deep ceramics collector. And um, we, were, we were talking about projects that I've done in the past um, that involved collecting materials from, specific, from a specific site and then making work that um, reflects upon that site. And um, I, I did a little bit of work. I was fortunate to do some work in Japan many years ago and um, the town I worked in, Mashiko, which is a traditional Japanese pottery village, is like many pottery villages anywhere you find in the world where it's, it exists because there are good natural materials there. there are, there's, good, there's a good clay deposit um, that, that, started, that people started making pots from, um, and then the village sort of built up around it. You see that in America, in Africa, anywhere in the world, similar things. The, when I went to Japan, that was the first time that I worked with local materials. Prior to that, I was really um, what I could only refer to, I guess, as an urban potter, meaning I ordered my materials and they showed up via UPS um, and got dropped in my parking lot and I got to work. So the materials were always important, but they weren't site specific. I chose the materials for certain qualities, for certain things they could do, you know, with in on the wheel or in my hands or in the kiln but where they came from wasn't so important. Um, so when I went to Japan, I, I had that experience. And then when I, when I came back to the States and um, I, I had an opportunity to do a project in Fort Worth at the Kimball Art Museum. And it was specifically um, inspired by an kind of architectural events that was occurring there in 2000, 
2012, but it, it was announced in 2010 or 11, which was that at the Kimball Art Museum, which is an incredibly important and beautiful building by Louis Kahn from 1972, they were doing a new building next to it. The, the same museum was doing a new building, a separate building that would be connected underground by Renzo Piano. And in addition to that, um, there was built a few years prior uh, a building by Tadao Ando just behind the Khan building for the Fort Worth Modern. And when I read about the Renzo building um, being commissioned, my, my immediate reaction was, I can't believe that those three architects are gonna be there in that same spot having this kind of architectural conversation. Um, you know, what a sort of unprecedented, amazing, potentially amazing cultural event, you know, if you're an architecture nerd, which I am. So um, for me, it was super exciting to, to read about. So I was, I was working on a separate project in Texas at the Nasher in Dallas, and I asked the people there if they knew anybody at the Kimball they could introduce me to so I could go and ask them about doing a project about this um, conversation between the three architects. So that they made a connection. I went there and I proposed to them that they give me access to the construction site and that I could harvest materials from it and try to make some work that somehow addressed the, this moment in Fort Worth um, where these three architects were having a conversation. And, you know, I had no idea what that would mean, but in any case, I spent several years going back and forth to Fort Worth. I, I did a very long, long, grueling, brutal project that, um, that addressed that question. And it was, uh, anyway, it, it wrapped up a few years ago and that was that. So this was one of the main topics of the conversation with this collector in New York was the Kimball project. Additionally, in the last six years, I've been spending a lot of time in the summers, well, specifically all summer, every summer for the last six years in Rhode Island working. And there, the work I've been doing is much more about local materials. So just to back step one second, um, the Fort Worth project the challenge was that the materials that were there were not necessarily quote unquote good materials. They weren't, there was not a pottery village springing up around these materials. This was, these were cultural materials. The meaning of these materials were cultural, not, um, not biological necessarily. The, the clay isn't good clay necessarily. I didn't even know that there would be clay there, but it turns out there was a lot of clay. But I, you know, I took clay, trees, water from the fountains, uh, broken stones and materials from the buildings that were demolished, you know, parts of the building that were demolished, anything I could get. The idea being to take anything I could get to make into some pots that addressed this, this cultural moment. So fast forward to the conversation with this guy in New York, we were talking about Rhode Island, Japan, the Kimball. And he said, um, you know, I've always thought it would be interesting for somebody to make a project that took clay from every state in the country what do you think of that? And I said, well, I think that's a brilliant idea and I wish I had had it, but, um, and I'm disappointed in myself that I didn't. And he said, well, you should take it. You should use that idea. And I, and I was like, well, that's very nice. Thank you. But I don't know how I feel about using somebody else's idea. Anyway, that was the end of that. We talked more and then I left and went home and it kept sort of ruminating in my brain for days and weeks. And I kept going back and forth of why would I do it? It's his idea, blah, blah. anyway it slowly took shape. And the shape that it took was, you know, the country was, has been so divided for, well, I mean, I don't know how many years, you know, I, I was going to say four years since the Trump election, but really it's more like 400 years or 500 years or since Europeans came to America and started displacing people who were already here um, since we started you know, bringing slaves here. I mean, you can choose your date where things started getting um, divided in this country, but they've only become progressively more so. Um, and so we're at, we were at this moment a year ago where I was thinking, you know, if I get clay from every state, well, also to sort of back step a little bit, I also expanded the idea of, well, clay is the, you know, is the ground, clay is representing the earth here. And, there's also trees, there's also water. Um, these are sort of the things that I think of as in addition to air as sort of the elements of the earth. So um, the idea became bigger than clay, it became clay, wood, trees, and water or plants. So um, 
then my thinking was, well, if I got these three ingredients from all 50 states and mix them together into a single material so that, the, so that in, instead of sort of acknowledging the differences um, of statehood and, you know, quote unquote civilization or the United States of America or whatever words you want to use, instead of um, celebrating that, which in my mind is emblematic of all of the division that we're experiencing. The this, this states are sort of symbols, you know, red, blue states, et cetera, et cetera, of a lot of the cultural divisions that we're experiencing. So if you look at this first slide and you look at that red line around what is effectively just nature, it kind of highlights what I'm trying to say, I think, in a very long-winded way. So in any case, um, I began the the project began to take shape in my mind as, as my own. And it, and it started to take shape as I'll make something, I'll collect these three materials from all of the 50 states and I'll make something that will be sort of symbolic of, or literally a tool for bringing people together. And that quickly became, a, maybe I'll just make a bowl. I'll make a bunch of bowls. And maybe, it'll, maybe I'll figure out a way to have some meals. And then it evolved into a bowl, a, cup and a plate, the three sort of most, fun. I mean, you know, it could, it, it's sort of arbitrary. It could have been 20 things, but my idea was that it's a humble way to eat a meal. It's not a 12 place, place setting. It's not about royalty. It's about basic implements for having a meal that would bring people together around food and, tr you know, try to find common ground. And I think that it's sort of a tried and true and tested way um, of that happening. You know, there are meals throughout history that have, that have um, resulted in peace treaties, whether it's within your family or, you know, with, between countries or whatever. So, so that was the first kind of the first steps. And then I thought, well, maybe it would be nice to also have some larger pots that were more kind of ceremonial or ritualistic or, not just um, a meal thing. So it became kind of two pieces to the project. So I'll run through a few slides and just, um, so then I started doing studies, like what would these plates, cups, bowls look like, you know, just try to find a really basic, some basic shapes that would um, kind of reference really the most fundamental forms, not be too designed, be things that would accommodate anything from you know, a stew to a bowl of cereal. You know, I didn't, it doesn't have to be a fancy dinner. It could be donuts and coffee. I mean, the idea is just to bring people together around food. And then I started doing some sort of shape studies for, well, what would these pots be? You know, would they be an egg is such a symbolic form of rebirth and et cetera, and, you know, structural integrity and whatever sort of metaphors you want to use. Um, a foot, you know, et cetera. And then I thought, well, I mean, let me just take, let me say clearly, this project is not subtle. Everything in it is like super heavy handed and literal. So the forms that wound up that evolved basically is, you know, my decisions were, oh, the form should probably be open instead of closed because open is more open. You know, you're more open symbolically to hearing what the person next to you has to say, potentially, even if you don't like it or, um, you know, it's more of a gesture towards the common ground thing, having a strong foot that it stands on. Um, it wound up with, so basically it evolved, you know, the page on the left is sort of form studies. The page on the right is more what wound up happening. So they wound up being, I, I used essentially the same amount of clay every time and made, um, oh, also I included the territories. So there are six US territories Puerto Rico, Guam, Virgin Islands, um, uh, American Samoa, Washington, D.C., and Northern Mariana Islands. I included those because they should be included. They should be states if they're subjects of the country. I mean, in my opinion, I'm not a politician, but it seems right. So there are now 56 of these things. There's 56 plates, cups, and bowls. The idea is to have meals for 56 people. And there are 56 of these pots that I... Um, think sort of represent a form um, that uh, is symbolic of, first of all, how they were made and what I'm trying to say. So they're open, they have these handles that are also sort of referencing ears. 
the pots are sort of beaten up. So they, you know, they are, um, <clears throat> anyway, here, here's some early studies of the plates, cups and bowls. Here are the 56 pots as they are now. So essentially what I've done is made 56 plates, cups and bowls, and I've made 56 of these pots. And the uh, materials that I'm collecting, I'm almost done collecting from the 56 states and territories will be mixed together and made into a glaze. And some of the ash will also be um, introduced into the kiln when it's at about 20, 250 degrees. So it becomes part of the atmosphere and it becomes part of the DNA of the kiln. And it also becomes glaze. Um, it melts as it hits the pots and becomes a glaze. So, um, so that is that here are just some bowls, you know, being made, they, they have common ground written on the bottom of the foot. Um, so then, then the next thing that happened was as I started thinking about, um, the meals, I, I very quickly realized I'm not the person to do this. Uh, I, I want to make these things and then I want to find somebody to work with who really understands um, the potential for what this project could be and ha and has the intelligence and the experience and the history and the connections, et cetera, to take it to another place because the food part of it um, is its own thing. It is, it is as much um, a metaphor for the bringing, bringing people together um, as it is a tool. I mean, the whole notion of food ways and the study of how food, the culture of food, the culture of growing food, um, cooking food, the cultures around food, who makes what, how it's evolved, how it's migrated through the country. It's a massive, massive subject of which I know nothing. I've been very tangentially um, involved with food and restaurants as a potter because that's just sort of inevitable. At some point in your career, you're going to make dinnerware for people and potentially restaurants. And I've done both. So I have a lot of chef friends and I, I, um, I feel an affinity for that world, but what I'm talking about with this project is very different than that. So I, um, you know, I don't want this to be like chef driven art gallery dinners. The, the, I want this to be, um, you know, a serious attempt at bringing people together really around a meal, the meal being the initial subject the food being the subject, who made it, why, who grew it, how, how did they cook it, where does it come from, what does it mean, all of those things are really important, powerful subjects of which, you know, like I said, I'm an architecture nerd, um, and I'm a fan, and, and I'm, it's similar in the food world, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, so I started doing research and asking around, and um, I asked some academic friends, if anybody knew anybody, anyway, I slowly found my way to Scott and, um, and I sent him a, you know, out of the blue email and he thankfully responded kindly. And Scott and I have been working together now since early in the summer. So it's probably been four or five months. Um, and it's been unbelievably fruitful and interesting for me. It's been like having a one-on-one -on -one graduate seminar on this subject. I, I'm so lucky. Um, and grateful. All right, I'll show you a couple more slides. So, so some of the material I harvested myself, this is clay, this is a dune at the beach in Rhode Island. And there's just a lot of clay there. Every time it rains, it falls and I go and pick it up. Um, that's some of it, you know, back at my studio. This is some other different clays in Rhode Island. So one of the beautiful things about the about this notion is that um, every state and territory, the clay and the water and the wood ash look so different and so similar like people um, do. You know, there's so many shared things in the DNA of those materials and there are so many differences and it's really remarkably beautiful to see them um, side by side. And then when I mix them, there's no way to know what it's gonna look like. It's, it's gonna be a completely unknown um, result and it it may be beautiful it may be ugly it will probably be somewhere in between or depending on the eye of the beholder or whatever but it's going to be really interesting to see 
Um, so, you know, ultimately the project is about, again, not subtly, inclusion, diversity, m mixing, not separating. You know, there's an interesting project in New York right now. I think it's still up in Andy Goldsworthy project where he did something similar. He collected clay from all 50 states, not 56, and he made flags, but each one is different. Each one represents the individual state. So, and that was something that, you know, I thought about in the beginning of the project. Do I make 56 separate things that acknowledge the 56 different places and their aesthetics? Or is that just reinforcing the separate nat nature of each one of these places? So the idea became to mix it. So when I haven't harvested it myself, I, I do this process where I send people a box like this. Within the box is a, um, a, a very heavy duty water bottle, two big Ziploc bags, and this sheet of paper that asks them the source of each of the materials and if there are any significance, any personal significance or cultural significance to the materials for them or any other reason. Some people write nothing. Some people write, you know, it came from my backyard, my tap and my fireplace. And then some people write like small treatises and it's, that's been super, super interesting. Um, and the project also has been really interesting because the people who, so I started by just emailing friends who I knew lived in certain places and then asking them if they knew people and, you know, like friend of a friend style. And then when I ran out of like, I got maybe halfway through, then I started posting on Instagram, asking people for help. And the responses were really great, super diverse. It's sort of the, the harvesting of the materials has been really a nice microcosm of the project itself because the 56 people who have participated are, are as diverse as the materials are, um, which has been really great. So anyway, these are just some boxes coming back. You see, so this is one that was, you know, particularly generous in terms of materials and text people, print out articles from the internet about stuff. I mean, it's, it's really amazing, the differences. This is just a big table in my studio sort of early on as materials were starting to come in. So this is just clay and you can see some of the difference and how amazing it is and very literal. Um, every once in a while, I wind up with two from a certain place by accident. Like someone says they'll do it then they disappear and then someone else comes and then they both come through. So. In some cases, there's more than one. So the next step will be to process all this clay and then mix it. So these are spice jars. Um, I'm gonna keep an archive of each of the materials like this permanently in these spice jars. This is what's being uh, in the, will be installed in Miami or is installed in Miami um, in, the, in the installation there. This is ash. You can see, again, the differences state by state, tree by tree. The nice thing about the ash is that a lot of it comes from cooking already. It comes from pizza ovens, barbecues, outdoor um, you know, fire pits where people are having campfires. So there's already a bunch of DNA uh, in it. Um, in addition to the DNA of the original plants. Waters, this is just water in a white bowl. You see, you know, it's, there's salt water, there's tap water, there's well water, there's river water. Um, these are the bags after they've been emptied from clay. I thought that was like a great plastic tapestry of colors. So that's it. That's the end of uh, what I have to say. Thanks so much for that, Adam. Uh, it's 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 really great to hear the the, the whole story uh, about the project, in, in, including the backstory. You know, when when you first sent me images of the project, I was of course in, initially struck by, as you said, how how different the, the clay looks um, from every state and and, and territory. But what's um, so sort of wonderful is that uh, learning more about it, you realize that behind every one of those clays is also a different person, right? Uh, you, you mentioned this, this survey uh, that, uh, that, that the people who helped you assemble this clay uh, filled out. And, and you mentioned that some, um, uh, you, you, know, you, uh, you had asked them to all uh, write down any sort of personal story they might have about the materials they were sending. And, and some wrote uh, <laughs> long, uh, I forget what you call them, not, not diatribes, but, uh, but, but, uh, <laughs> but some really went for it. And I, I, I'm wondering if you could share some of those 
um, uh, stories with us or, or, or what so some of those yeah. were about? I mean, I, I hadn't thought about that specifically, but there, I mean, so also people sent photographs, several people um, involved their children. And, you know, the, a lot of this was done, most of it, most of the uh, people who I don't know did it during COVID because that's, that was sort of lined up with the time when I was doing public outreach rather than through friends of friends kind of thing. But um, so a lot of the people I don't know. Um, uh, so uh, one, so the, yes, there are many people with, you know, pictures of their kids in the river or, you know, pulling clay out of the river. There was one with a little boy in Hawaii standing in the ocean, like, of course, gorgeous, you know, blue water in the ocean, holding two big handfuls of clay. And the woman wrote that this was from a beach that's a super special beach where people go to say goodbye to their loved ones, I guess, spread their ashes. So again, like in addition to the clay, there's the water from there and there's also the ash. There's the DNA of people who have passed floating around in there, which is super beautiful and profound. Um, but the kids just all smile. You know, it's just a kid with clay in the ocean. Somebody um, said that they, it was very sparse. It was just like my tap, my fireplace. And then the clay was, I was digging a hole in my backyard to bury my 20 year old hen and I hit clay. That's pretty weird and cool, right? Um, also kind of full circle to the food thing, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, totally. Well, I mean, uh, like on that note, <clears throat> you know, another nice thing that you said was you referred to the, uh, these, um, these, these, these vessels as both a metaphor and a tool, right? And I guess the, the, the tool part refers to, um, uh, you know, how, how they'll be used or at least the, the dinner sets. And, uh, and, uh, and, and here I'd, I'd like to ask Scott, you know, sort of, uh, you know, how, how are you approach, I mean, the, the, well, first of all, the idea of, of organizing 56 dinners for 56 people <laughs> seems, seems really daunting. But, um, but, but what, 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 what was your initial response uh, when, when Adam came to you with this crazy idea, or I guess you probably developed it together, but, um, but how are you approaching these, th these meals? Because there are so many layers to this project. I Thank you, Eric, and Design Miami for inviting us here. I want to acknowledge that I stand on Lenape land here in New York City. And that is important to me and part of this project because I, I've been thinking about it as we've talked. I had one meeting during uh, lockdown, but mostly it's been over the phone or maybe on FaceTime. And how do you organize this given the strictures that he set up? So one of the ways has been to think about originary or native local foods within a given region, foods that we have uh, ascribed to the indigenous populations. Concurrently, I've thought, well, we are a nation of immigrants. Do we also try to think about what are called transfer foods? Uh, example is the Colombian exchange and the things that come with the Africans, whether they brought them or were brought by the colonizers. Things like okra, watermelon, sesame seeds, uh, black eyed peas, these kinds of things. Or hybrids where we have something like collard greens that are from Northern Europe, but the preparation that we associate is usually from Africa. So this is a very interesting dialectic between materials and origins and people. For me, what seems to be the through line is to try to the degree that we can in each setting to find uh, various points of intersection of culture and food and bring people together. And what I'm working with right now is a loose outline because we can't have it be the same. It wouldn't make sense and it wouldn't ring in any way. It would be like fast food and getting the same burger. Right? Um, so I've been thinking about things like, uh, maybe there's one dish that's greens. Now that could be raw, that could be cooked, that could be seaweed. But in every locality, whether they get it from the ocean or they get it from the land, whether it's a, a romaine lettuce or collard greens or dulse, there could be something that we think of as a leafy green. And that could be interpreted by each group. Uh, part of it, as you say, it's uh, logistical, it requires many lieutenants. And so I've already started to recruit people that I know I had worked for over 30 years as a chef and I'm about a dozen years in academic. So in both camps, I have ways to touch people of different origins to think about 
how do we marshal in a given place, people who are reflective of the place and the diversity of the place, some of which you may not realize are your neighbors. And so that's the kind of way I've been thinking about it, reading a lot, talking with Adam, trying to finesse it and think about what it, what it needs to be, and also leaving it, as he said about his pots, open, because it, I think the way this is most successful, my perception, is to give somebody some uh, suggestions or an, an inspiration, but let them reflect what comes out of their culture, their locality. Um, if that's local fish, you know, we haven't decided, should it be vegan? What do we do with uh, allergies or religious prohibitions? So there's many things to consider. Um, but I think that needs to come as much out of the locality. Can I add something to that? One of the, one of the really interesting things that Scott and I have sort of gone down a rabbit hole on and hopefully we'll figure our way back out at some point is trying to decide where to have the meals. And the original kind of my original, you know, not subtle idea and not smart idea was oh, we'll have one in every state, which of course makes no sense because the idea is to erase the lines of statehood. The project is about not, not celebrating statehood. It's about celebrating one, you know, ideally unified land mass. Um, so once we started having these conversations about where are we going to do them, you know, you could go on for years making, we're basically trying to make a map. And what we're doing is layering all these other maps on top of one another, trying to find kind of, conver as Scott said, converging places of, co of significant convergence. So the maps could be um, migration maps, you know, f over the last 400 years, how people have moved through the country, immigration maps, um, population maps, agricultural maps, crop maps. Um, they could be current political maps. They could be mass shooting maps. They could be racial killing maps. They could be police killing maps. I mean, you start layering um, and then you wind up with places that maybe originally you wouldn't think as super significant, like El Paso, Texas, for example, quickly rises to the top as a place that has many, many of these things happening, um, old and new, um, you know, good and bad. So, so we, we haven't, you know, we're a year into the, I mean, Scott and I are three or four months into the, his part of the project together, but that's, that's really fascinating. Um, and there's so many like, oh, we, of course we should have one in DC because it's DC. And it has many, you know, many, many, many of those things happening as well. But we, we, we're not going to have 100 meals. I don't know what the number is going to be. Um, or maybe we will. Maybe it'll go on for the next 10 years and there'll be 100, you know, in 10 years. But um, anyway. And just to uh, add one little bit to what he's saying, and thank you for saying that, Adam. If you think of the convergences, for example, if we're in Wyoming, you can both acknowledge Native American history and Sitting Bull and all of those kinds of histories that some of us learn in school, but you should also acknowledge somebody like Matthew Shepard. So then it calls on me or us to then reach out as I have, for example, to some of my gay and lesbian friends to say, what is significant to you geographically? I mean, Stonewall in New York gets held up. There's a cafeteria in San Francisco that predates Stonewall. But what are the other geographies that resonate for you that I might not know? And so that is also part of the process to me is that as we finalize this or finesse it maybe is better, whether it's a Native American community, a gay community, Black, Latino, what have you, what do they hold dear or hold as a site of memory that may not be savory, um, you know, Tule Lake for the Japanese, et cetera. Great. Yeah, uh, first of all, I, then I, I need to correct myself what I said earlier. So it will not be 56 uh, meals in 56 states and territories. I, I guess I was using old information. So it's, it's yeah. great also to hear how, how this project is, is, still, uh, is still evolving. And now, Scott, um, it seems like you're also talking about these uh, these dinners as as uh, as having a kind of memorializing uh, uh, aspect to them is 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 that correct or you know one of the things that I think have thought about since I met Adam 
a dear now departed friend of mine, uh, John Edgerton, who was a, a civil rights worker from Nashville. He wrote a very important book, um, Look Now Before the Day, I think it's called, about the, what whites can do to, to help the civil rights movement. But he also wrote a book called Southern Food, looking at in the, I guess the 80s, where, where, where Southern food was at. And the introduction, he cites that in the late 60s, Charlotte, North Carolina had to desegregate its schools after other municipalities had. And whether or not they wanted to come together, the city fathers and mothers, the ministers, the educators all came, decided to meet in a church and they thought to start it to have what they would call a covered dish supper. And when they took the dishes off, they realized that both black and white ate black eyed peas or yams or corn. And it opened the door for them to be able to talk in a way that they hadn't thought. It was not orchestrated, it was serendipitous, but it allowed them to see that, oh, we, we eat and grow the same things. There's something that we do share and it, it, it broke ground and broke bread. And so I think that um, with that as a through line, it, it can be the memorialization of just the sharing of food and it will most likely also have to herald things that we aren't always um, learning outside of our own ethnic religious group that the larger community needs to know as we've been hearing in this crazy election season about different types of Americas. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is one of those projects where the, the sort of deeper you dig, the, the more complicated uh, things get, right? And, 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 That's and but I guess, you know, fundamentally, one of the, the, the really interesting uh, challenges is how you bring uh, together kind of these notions of you know, because you're sort of you're sort of erasing boundaries all over the place while also respecting them, right? Like, I mean, the, the, this project is about kind of erasing uh, state boundaries, but at the same time, you're kind of acknowledging, um, the, the, you know, the the, the kind of uh, uh, histories and and peoples that 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 are uh, specific to these different geographies. You know, when, when you talk about food, you know, uh, and, and this is something that we had briefly uh, brought up. Uh, in, in a previous conversation, I mean, you know, who 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 sort of owns uh, you know different types of of, of food? I mean, if, if we talk about um, um, you know tomatoes as being indigenous to uh, to this region, I mean, does that mean the the Italians no longer have <laughs> have, have a claim on, uh, on 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 tomatoes? Um, and also, when you talk about you know uh, people and how we sort of uh, you know, group ourselves. I mean, as we all know, you know, all of us have multiple identities and, and, and oftentimes um, uh, very uh, uh, ill-defined identities. Uh, Adam, you're an artist, designer, and potter. You know, what does that mean? So I, I, I guess it, it would be great to, um, you know, really hear from all of you, uh, in, including you, Bobby, uh, who can maybe speak to the sort of uh, disciplinary boundary blurring uh, and whatever else. Uh, that uh, that is pertinent to this uh, conversation about how you negotiate, uh, you know, uh, the specific and um, and the more fluid. Well, I think that you know I can jump in, and I think that Adam's career is a great example of that. Like you were saying, Eric. I mean, um, first, I want to thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Um, and, and I also want to acknowledge that I'm currently in Los Angeles, um, where I'm a guest here in the ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva people. So I extend my respect and gratitude to the many indigenous people who call these lands home. Um, and speaking of land, you know, what's interesting to me about Common Ground is the way that Adam has merged his early artistic knowledge um, with these messages of hope and social justice and building bridges um, and using the potential of art to speak to one of the greatest challenges of our time, which, is, you know, especially this year and this month, um, which is how we can come together, how we can see each other, hear each other, um, cope, and even thrive through our differences. And, you know, Adam's story as an artist, he he's has a very interesting trajectory. He, you know, when I first met him 
when I came to LA, he was running um, his own studio at Water Pottery. And then he joined Heath Ceramics as an artist in residence. And now he's back um, in an independent studio. And when I look at the pieces that make up Common Ground, the very sculptural pots, um, and then the very utilitarian plate and bowl and cup, um, it makes me reflect on how those different eras of his career um, have come together. How like his explorations of the single mass, 25 pounds of clay, the same clay for every pot are modified and manipulated um, into an expressive form. Um, if I were to be like as unsubtle as Adam is, <laughs> the idea that we're all made of the same stuff, but that each of us has different influences and inputs and, and that's what makes us unique. Um, and with the utilitarian pieces, um, these are very common, ordinary objects, um, but they have heightened meaning. They're they're not formal. They're not just for dinner. Like Adam said, you could have, you know, you can use them as a cereal bowl. Um, there's no specific cultural reference. Um, but to me, when I looked at those sketches that he made, they really reminded me of Heath forms, like Heath Ceramics, which is a legendary California ceramic company that was founded in the 40s. And... Um, still exists, ongoing concern. And really the core of the company is about care. Um, not And not just care in terms of making a high quality product, which they do, um, but also care about em its employees and its customers and the environment. And so like bringing those two pieces together seems very um, typical of, and, and makes sense when I think of what Adam has done and how he's crossed those different uh, disciplinary boundaries um, in his work. Yeah, great. Um, I don't know if if, uh, if Scott or Adam want to respond to my uh, my my. Well, I can say something. You know, I my own split decision. I started out in the arts and got a BFA, and and for many years worked in New York doing. Um, everything. I did a little bit of ceramics, it's very minor in my world, uh, printmaking, but mostly jewelry and metal work. And though from pre-K to today, I've always cooked. I had a mother who wanted to be a chef, which was a fabulous and silly idea for a black woman in the, what would have been the late thirties in New York City to A, as a woman and B, as a black woman, to think that she could do that. She ended up in her first career as a dietitian, but she raised her two sons to, in ways, kind of the way Native Americans, I hate to keep going back to it, but be in this liminal state, teaching us men's boys things and girls things. So all of the kind of domestic labor was part of what we learned in growing up. And at least to be able to care for ourselves. And both my brother and I are good cooks and I obviously became professional. So I have this one pole that's really uh, grounded in the arts and grounded in practice. And then I come back to school about a dozen years ago to become more theoretical. I'm not saying that I wasn't theoretical before, but to really steep myself and learn that side of it. So for me, it's always about using practice to apply theory. And so that's one of the things that for me is exciting about Adam's work and this prospect of collaborating together because often I find theory is often masturbatory, often it's very interesting, but it can be an ungrounded. And I like to see some evidentiary aspect at some point. And so I think that's embodied in the way I look at things and the way I work. I'm doing some independent projects that are taking theories as you nicely introduced me to deal with race and, and difference, but using practical material goods to have that discussion so it can exist like this project in the public sphere. Because that, especially for somebody where I am, I can write for journals and books and that's important and I do it, but I also wanna to communicate to people in my community. And I think that is this multidisciplinary, multi-hatted way of living and working and thinking that is important to me. 
Well, that's great. So, I mean, like, uh, I mean, I, I, I know you're still sort of uh, working all these th things out, but, but of course, the the beauty of these dinners uh, also, well, as in all dinners, is the extent to what they to which they they bring people together, right? And and I think your intention here is to bring people together who might not normally, you know, uh, uh, come together. And and I, I'm just. Uh, again, knowing that this is a, a very much this is very much an, an, an in progress uh, thing, uh, how how do you think you might go about, you know, uh, deciding who to invite or or, or uh, curating, let's say, the guests? That's a big that's a that's a big question that we um, we've discussed. Obviously, Scott and I have discussed and also sort of pushed down the road. Um, I mean, if you imagine like the first, one of our first tasks is sort of solidifying the map, you know, whatever we want to call it. Well, it'll be a map. It'll be, a, 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 let's say a map of at least the first year of meals. And once we choose the city or this town or the farm or whatever it is, I mean, another conversation we're having is, should all the meals be outside? Should some, should they be inside? Does it matter? Should they be Man should it be mandatory that they're cooked over open flame or can you use a wolf range and a commercial kitchen? You know, um, how, how much do we want to mandate or do we want to just say, okay, we're going to El Paso. There's this incredible woman there who is a, you know, Mexican American chef who specializes in this. There's this other person who's incredible chef who specializes in that. And Scott pulls together a small team of people who collaborate on a meal and then the next step is who gets to come to the meal. And the idea, as you said, is that it's 56 people who wouldn't ordinarily be at dinner together. So, you know, it could be, you name it. It could be a couple of people from the local firehouse. It could, it could be people from the local homeless shelter. It could be clergy. It could be, I mean, I don't know if, even if we would be the deciders or if the lieutenants, the local lieutenants would be the deciders because they know the community and, all we mandate is that we require unbelievable diversity in every feasible way. You know, any way you define the word diversity that needs to be at the table. Everyone has to have a seat at the table. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I think that's as far as I've gone in my head and I, I don't know what's going on in Scott's head. <laughs> Pretty similar, you know, one of the things without trying to make it sound religious, if anybody's ever been to a Sikh langar, which is a communal vegetarian meal. And one of the things like many of South Asian and Islamic people, you take your shoes off, you wash your feet, right? And one of the things that does is it it's, it's decontextualizes where you come from in your socioeconomic hierarchy because you're sitting down next to somebody else barefoot, right? And then you're served and you can, I, I did one in Hong Kong actually, where we help cook. I've done them in New York. But, um, and there's a very good movie named He Himself Cooks made by a French couple that shows, you know, their grand uh, temple in India where they you know, do something like 20,000 meals a day just to, you know, for free. Now, obviously that's not what we're doing, but that kind of deconstructing the hierarchy. And I agree with Adam, it's more than likely there'll be somebody that he's gonna know, or I'm gonna know in Milwaukee or what have you but I really think the lieutenants will dictate more of what happens in terms of who's at the table, however the table looks. You know, I, I've thought about the Paris peace talks and all those months of what should the table shape be, if you remember back then in the 70s. I don't want to get into that minutia, but there's so many details. And I think at one point, the best that we can do is to establish certain key protocols and then be in clear communication with the people who are in each regional or as farm or what have you venue. Because of course, it, you know, one of the things I think that we've talked about is if you think of the biggest cities, New York, LA, Houston, et cetera, Chicago, where is it in those cities? It's more than likely should be. And should it be three in each city? And if you're in LA, where is it best in LA? Should it be in Compton, you know, kind of thing and, and so there's a lot of nuance to be resolved but i i tend to believe if it's in a place that neither any of us have been to or know well 
that that's when the conversations with the lieutenants will say, well, if you're going to be in LA, pretending for a minute that Bobby and, and Adam are not from LA, um, these are the places that I think would be the most conducive. And these are the six or eight communities that you might want to consider talking to and trying to pull out, flesh out both and cooks and chefs, you know, there's got to be home cooks who are recognized in their community as much as somebody who might be a chef who will not try to over gussy it up. Now, I think if I'm not mistaken that one place it will not be is in museums, right? Uh, or, or sorry, uh, 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 Bobby, were, were you about to say something? Oh, I mean, it's sort of a following off what Scott was saying, you know, thinking through the menu and the place. I've also been thinking about like, well, what is, what is the structure? Is it, is it a free form conversation or is there mm. um, a discussion leader? Um, and that made me think of two things. One is, you know, a Passover Seder, which is very structured and there's a series of texts that are read, but it's, they're almost there, they're, but questions are encouraged. It's like a jumping off point for discussion. So I find that a, a useful structure, but also like Theaster Gates Soul Food Pavilion, where he brings together lots of different people and there are performances and different um, kind of talks and speeches and things that um, foster conversation, that allow conversation to happen conversations to happen that wouldn't maybe happen organically. But um, I wondered if that was part of your thoughts yet. Yeah, I think, I think that the Seder is a really good um, analogy. And um, I mean, Eric, I wouldn't categorically say, you know, that, that nothing's going to happen at a museum because there could be a museum that is a, like LACMA, for example, where Bobby is, has a, a campus that has outside space. It also has uh, satell a couple of satellite locations that are um, in different neighborhoods in the city. And it could, make, it could make sense to have a meal at one of those places. What I would say it probably isn't gonna be is like the board of directors of a museum in the board's dining room. Um, right. That, it's, that's not the point. Um, but, in, but there's no reason to, to disqualify museums as a venue for sure. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, this is, um, there's a lot of interesting artistic and historical precedents in terms of performance and food that I think um, would are useful to think about as you continue developing the idea. Like, you know, Alan, like in the 60s, like the performances like Alan Capro's Eat and Suzanne Lacey and Linda Pruess's International Dinner Party, mm -hmm. which was sort of in the anticipating Judy Chicago's feminist masterwork. Um, and then up through Rick Ritt Taravajana's exhibition slash performances, Cooking Thai Food, which, which was really about care and about, mm -hmm. you know, providing for people um, as, as his work of art. So, so I think that while this collaborative nature with Adam collecting the materials and making the dinner and Scott thoughtfully creating the menus um, is unprecedented. This idea of artists using food to express ideas and to forge connections among strangers actually has a long tradition. And so it does follow in the, that in a really nice way. Uh, that's, that's, that's really a great context, uh, Bobby. Thanks for that. No. I mean, uh, have you guys been looking at some of these other projects uh, as, as references, uh, Scott, and, Scott and Adam? Some of them that I know, yes. And, and, you know, of course, I think about Judy Chicago's dinner party, dinner party that is not per se a meal, but is trying to use the table metaphor to reveal people that should be together, or should be known. Um, so I think these are, are, are is very salient and many, much of what, Bobby just mentioned is important. And I'm remembering there was a show at the New York Public Library um, a couple of years back. And one of the aspects were these uh, early salons of feminists and lesbians who met in New York City, but they wanted to be anonymous because they were under threat. And so they created all this data, but then they hid it or destroyed it because they didn't want to be known and be subject to, to uh, legal problems. 
You know, so we have, a, Bobby's right, there are many permutations of, of what this can and should or could look like. And from many vectors of uh, like a religious grouping, as you said, which the Seder is good. And I've thought about Tundi Wei, who also like um, Theaster uses questions and creates subgroups of unrelated people to create a discourse. For me, I think there's a certain amount of uh, given a story about the food and how, it, how the food came to be in a given place um, that the people who produce it and to honor the people, which has become more common. Um, and then some level of querying that might have to have a form. Um, I think what more than likely in my mind's eye would be much the way Adam set up his template of the request form to get the clay and the water, et cetera. The conversation, the pre-conversation with the lieutenants would be to ask them about some of the things that might need to be discussed that if just, let's say, if we were unrelated in there, we each have a history and a community that we're bringing if we were each a lieutenant making a meal in, in Miami, say, that I don't know that you know, Eric, that then I would ask you, what can you impart about this place or the food from this place or the community that you want to include that could easily uh, generate the beginning of story talking. Mm. Yeah. And I, I guess I look at, the other one I look at is um, this premise that the historian Benedict Anderson established called Imagine Communities, where I don't know you, but there's something we share. And in, in the case that in his kind of landmark book, one of those sharing was the newspaper. If we read, if we all read fill in the blank, the New York Times or whatever, you can be in, in Shanghai and, and they can be in LA, but we have this knowledge we're sharing because we, we do the same thing. So if I think the same way, if we're all in this, on this earth, on this part of the earth in North America and it's um, former territories or colonies, um, how can we see each other in that shared space if we take away the boundaries, as, as Adam has said. So how can we create that imagined community? What would be the, the way that I can see you if I'm sitting next to you and don't know you, you know, other than having a name tag, hi, my name is Eric, hi, my name is Scott, I'm from Connecticut, you know, I live in New York. You know, no, I don't want that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's a really, uh, that, that's a really uh, uh, amazing uh, point, Scott. Uh, um, I, I think we're running a little bit short on time, and, and, and I just wanted to give everyone a chance to, to, to say anything else that might be on their mind or, or, or that's important to add. Uh, I mean, if not, I, I mean, I, I think what Scott just said was, was a really great, <laughs> great way to, uh, to end this talk. And if I can just sort of add to that, um, you know, uh, speaking of, of this project as, as a metaphor, um, uh, when you talk about bringing all these different clays together into one clay, like obviously the, the, the immediate metaphor that might come to mind uh, would be this notion of the melting pot, which is what I grew up with, you know, America as a melting pot, which, we, uh, which soon became seen as being problematic, right? Because it, uh, it, it, it implied this erasure of differences in favor of a kind of assimilation with, um, you know, with, with, with the dominant culture and and we've sort of bro broken that down uh, and and in fact we, we we've torn down uh, and problematized a lot of things that needed to be torn down um, and problematized uh, but then the question is you know what do we build up you know in its place and uh, I, I think uh, you know in some ways I, I think you know this 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 clay that you're <laughs> that you're that you're developing is, uh, is a kind of melting pot, but it's 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 a melting pot coming from a different place with a different story, right? And 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 so, um, I, I think it's really wonderful to uh, to to see uh, going back to what what you've been saying, Scott, that uh, that uh, we we can still talk about commonalities, you know, without erasing differences, and that we can also read multiple uh, metaphors uh, and and narratives in order to find uh, multiple meanings of America that can coexist uh, at the same time. So 
Uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for being part of this discussion. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Adam especially for uh, doing this, for, for starting this project and also uh, bringing it to uh, Design Miami uh, in this incredible installation that I hope some of our uh, viewers got to see. Uh, this project, as everyone can tell, is an ongoing one. Uh, Adam, how can people sort of uh, keep track of it? Should they go to your website or? Yeah, my website, Instagram mostly is the most active thing. Um, and I think my Instagram is Adam Silverman Studio, uh, I'm pretty sure. Um, and my okay. website is adamsilverman.net. But I, I am setting up a specific website for it. I think it's called Common Ground 2020 is the website, is the URL I was able to get. Um, and that should be coming soon. Um, you know, we're trying to do a website. We're hoping to make a book that will be reflective of everything. Um, so there's a lot more to come. Yeah, we are really, we're a year in and I don't know how, I don't know if that represents 10% or 50%. And Eric, I just want to add one little point. Please. I like that you brought up the melting pot and I don't know if you know, but they've moved the metaphor and the current one is toss salad. And yes, I salad is so that we can have individuality, but it becomes a cohesive thing as the salad, but we taste all the individual bits. So we know what's going to be on the menu and, and, at some of your dinners, at least. Yeah. <laughs> all right, great. Well, again, thanks so much, uh, Scott, Bobby, uh, and, and, and Adam, and uh, we'll all look forward to, to hearing more as this, this incredible uh, project uh, continues to evolve. So, and, and thanks to all of our, our viewers for, uh, for watching. And also, I, I want to, uh, again, thank uh, Freeman Benda for, for supporting uh, our ability to, to have this project uh, at Design Miami. Thank thanks. you. Thank you all. I'm very grateful. Thank you all for doing this. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks, Scott.